Hi, everybody. Okay. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars, and we're up to like 242. Um, we took a short break while I went to Africa, which was fantastic. And we're going to have a webinar on, on the safari. I think it's on the 19th of November. So be sure to tune in for that. I'll have fantastic photos. We saw amazing game. But tonight, my guest is Jillian Kreinbring, and it's so nice to have her back. I'm really excited. And so Jillian, I'm going to let you introduce yourself for those who may not know you, although I think that's probably a, a small number, but it's always nice for people when they watch the recording to, to hear a little bit about your background. So welcome and thank you for joining me. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you again, Wendy, for having me. I love doing these. They're they're just so so fun to share little snippets of information and Hopefully, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily brain surgery, but it's good little pieces of information that people can put to use, which I, I, I feel inspired by that because, you know, that's why we do what we do is to, to, to share and to pass along the knowledge that other generous people have shared with us. So thank you again for having me. Oh, no worries. And you know, the, the best part for me is that I have people email me or message me and tell me how they've used the information from the webinars to make positive changes for their horses. And that's really what this is all about. So it's it's really great to get that feedback to know that this the webinars are really making a difference. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, I'm uh, Jillian Cranbring, and I live in Waring, Texas, a really tiny little town on the Guadalupe River. And uh, about three years ago, uh, my partner and I, uh, we purchased uh, this farm that we called Serrata Ranch, which uh, Serrata means self-carriage in Latin, which I just think is like the coolest. My friend Caroline came up with that name. So we were like, yeah, that's that's a really, that's a very appropriate name given that, you know, we put so much emphasis on on posture here at the ranch for people and, and horses. Um, you know, I was super, super lucky as a kid. My my family were horse people. And so I literally was riding in, in my mother's womb as she rode, you know, eight and a half months pregnant. And then, you know, the, the minute they gave me. Uh oh, you froze. A great child. Oh, am I here again? You froze a tiny bit. Yep. But you're back. That little a little tiny bit. Um, yeah, I had a great childhood, Wendy. Um, I was pretty much untethered. I was an old. Rats. We worked so on I our just spent my. Is it is it still freezing? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Um. Anyway, I just had a great childhood uh, growing up with horses and, you know, they were my best friends and uh, I lived in the country. So there wasn't really anything other than horses for me. Uh, and I started showing horses when I was eight years old and I showed really extensively in um, the quarter horse circuit in the paint horse circuit and abroad up until I was 27 when I started graduate school. And at that time I took a uh, change of direction, so to speak. I had some epiphanies happen in my life. I, I had a pretty serious riding accident and, and broke my back. And I didn't really know if I was gonna have a riding future after that. And um, it was during that accident that I, I realized that I really didn't know anything about horses. And so um, that's when I really became a dedicated student of the horse. And um, that accident was um, the impetus for me to develop my core studies in, in the graduate program, which was to study functional anatomy, because I really wanted to understand what it was that my instructors were asking for from me and my horses. I didn't want just to be codependent on my instructor. I wanted to be able to develop critical thinking skills so I could think myself through it uh, uh, situation with uh, individual horses. And so, you know, the study of functional anatomy has just, oh my goodness, it has opened so many doors for me. And you know, it is understanding how a horse is put together and how the horse should use his body so that it's 
about his health and, and vitality and longevity is very different from the world where I came from, which was let's train a horse to fit a particular trend so that we could win ribbons and money, you know? And so it was really quite eye-opening to realize that many of the things I was asking for from my horses were just simply unfair, if not impossible. So the study of functional anatomy has, has really humbled me and continues to humble me um, about how I proceed with the individual horses in my life. And you know, Wendy, it's, it's not the whole pie. I mean, there's so many other things to consider it, uh, on our horsemanship journey. But you know, I think it's a very important slice of the pie to, to become an educated equestrian. You, you need to know a little bit about who they are as a species. So uh, that's why I, st I study this particular piece of the pie amongst other pieces of the pie. Uh, I think, you know, COVID has been very interesting because mm. We, we are almost now over inundated with information. You know, there's so much information out there now on Facebook and the internet. And that's good because it's, it's good to be informed, um, but it doesn't replace experience. And so even though I teach functional anatomy based from a theoretical perspective, it isn't a substitute for learning the application skills and seeking out people who can help you learn technique um, and approaches to training horses that are in alignment with correct functional anatomy. So as much as I encourage people to, to learn the theory, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like I said, right now we, we are, over inundated with information. And I think I read somewhere a couple of weeks ago where they said, we're, we're flooded with information, but we lack in wisdom. Mm. And, uh, and that's and the I, internet as a whole. <laughs> it, that is the internet as a whole. So again, you know, the information that I share about functional anatomy, it's important, but it doesn't replace going out and working with somebody who can actually help you apply that theory to 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 your practices with with horses and that's what i do i always am seeking out people who who train in alignment with with that base of knowledge and and i'll tell you it's not easy to find instructors that align with that um but i'm very lucky that i have found people that i can learn from that that know a lot more about how to put the theory to the test so yeah well and it's it's Overall, I think that people are seeking more knowledge and information. And as that happens, I think it will kind of sift the wheat from the chaff and that people will find the, the instructors that are teaching a, a way that's about making the horse healthy as opposed to just putting them in, in a shape. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so what are we gonna talk about tonight? Well, um, so I thought, we had talked about in our first couple uh, webinars, we talked about the hyoid and its connections. We talked about the scaffolding of the horse and a little bit about how the hyoid and the AO joint um, relate to overall posture. And when, when you look at the neurology of a horse, to make it very simple, because neurology is not simple at all, but to make it really simple, you can think about, uh, we've got the parasympathetic system where horses are operating more in a thinking place as Linda Tellington Jones would say, you know, more when you're chilled and relaxed as opposed to your sympathetic centers where you have a horse that's anxious and is more reactive, so to speak. So if you look at those two electrical circuits, let's say of the neurology, when, when we're talking about the sympathetic mode, the, the sympathetic centers within the nervous system actually lie along the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. But the parasympathetic mode where we're relaxed, so, so to speak, uh, where we can actually learn and not react, lies on a, another circuit, which stems in the cranial base or at the head and at the sacrum hence cranial sacral, 
in terms of as an approach to uh, body work. So I thought since we had talked about one part of the parasympathetic system, now we can talk about the sacrum and its connections. And we're gonna look mostly at the sacrum as an individual bone and then two very special connections that the sacrum has in terms of very important joints within uh, the horse's body. Cool. All right. right. Well, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to take over there. All right. Well, let me go here, share my screen. Okay. Let me see if I can find what I need to find here. Okay, so Wendy, I shared my screen, but I don't see my PowerPoint here. Yeah, uh, it didn't go to screen share yet. Oh, oh, it didn't. It must be because I'm I'm slow here. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. All right. I better put my glasses on. Now that I'm over 40, my mom told me, Oh, Jill, just wait till you turn 40. Everything's going to change. And I thought, no, it's not going to change. And it did. It totally did. I need glasses. Now That's why I have time. cool frames, because when I had to have glasses, I was like, at least they're going to be fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and they are fancy. They're cool, man. Yep. Yep. That was my that one was concession to having to wear glasses. Well, there you go. That was one thing I noticed when I lived in Europe, they had the best glasses. I was always admiring the Europeans glasses. Yep, that's where I get my frames. <laughs> ah, okay, so um, tonight's short little lecture is entitled The Sacral Connection. And I thought we would just start off by taking a look at the sacrum itself. So this is a picture of the sacrum from a dorsal perspective, meaning from above or like a bird's eye view. And just lately, well, I shouldn't say lately, uh, Wendy, but this last year has been really quite an amazing challenge for me because I've taken my functional anatomy course and we just finished it today <laughs> to uh, offer it as an online course. So. <laughs> Congratulations, then, that's a lot of work. <laughs> oh girl, I never knew. I, I bit off more than I could chew, but I'm so glad that we did it. And um, I'm gonna uh, enjoy a little uh, a little sip of bourbon later on uh, this evening to, to, <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> celebrate, it's, absolutely. It's been a day and night project. Well, anyway, when I, uh, when I was pulling together and researching and rebuilding some of my slides, um, I was really curious about the word sacrum in general. And so when I was looking up uh, the sacrum, uh, the word derives actually from the word sacred, which I find enormously interesting. And that the sacrum was referred to in Latin and Greek as the holy bone. And if you look at the bone itself, here on the screen, you can see maybe why this bone would be referred to as the holy bone. And, um, and I find that to be quite symbolic of, of the significance of the sacrum in the horse's body as well. And if, if you are an acupuncturist, the lumbosacral joint junction is a very sacred place for um, acupuncture points. And my, my late um, and dear friend and much loved teacher, Mark Russell, would always tell me, Jill, there are two very sacred places in the horse's body. One is at the AO joint and the other is at the sacrum. And that has always really stayed in my mind because we hear so much about the importance of helping the horse to engage his hindquarters. And so it seems like the holy grail of riding oftentimes are that people are chasing the horse's hind end. And then they rush the horses forward and they cram the horse in the front end. So they're either riding the horse from the back to the front or from the front to the back, but it's really the middle of the horse um, that we want 
to come up and connect the front and the back of the horse. And Mark always used to say to me, if you help the horse release the jaw, he will then grant you access to the hindquarters to ride the horse forward. And so he was always kind of playing back and forth between these two primary structures within the horse to actually get the middle of the horse to where it needed to be. So I find it quite um, symbolic that it was referred to just as that, sacred and as the holy bone. All right. Maybe, how do I go to my next slide? Just gotta get, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So the sacrum, the two pictures that you see there on your right, one is a lateral perspective and the bottom picture is the one that we just saw from a dorsal view. And then the graphic of the horse on the left is simply showing in red the sacrum and where it is located within the horse's body. So just some basic um, facts about the sacrum is that the sacrum is the set of spinal vertebrae that follow the horse's lumbar vertebrae. And we're gonna talk about how the lumbar vertebrae connect with the sacrum specifically here in just a little bit. The sacrum in general um, has five naturally fused vertebrae. Every once in a while, we have a, a horse that, that might have one less or one more, but in general, there are five naturally fused vertebrae. And if you notice, if you look at those pictures, you're gonna see these little holes, okay? And on the dorsal perspective of the horse, those little holes that lie below the tall dorsal processes are what's referred to as foramen. And those foramen are exit and enter sites for peripheral nerves that communicate with the spinal column. And there are um, on the sacrum, if you look at the sacrum cranially or from the front, there are seven articular joint surfaces in total. So what in the heck does that mean? Well, anytime you hear me use the word articular, joint surfaces. All that means is that there are seven specific sites on the sacrum that articulate or connect with another bone. Okay, so we're going to look, I'm going to stop my, my screen share here, um, and I'm going to look at the bone itself. So we're going to stop the screen share and now you're going to see my darn mug again. Okay, so I want to show you the sacrum bone as it is. Okay. I'm going to spotlight you so that that's even bigger. Yep. Awesome. I can back up here. Okay. So this is the horse's sacral bone. Okay. Now, if I show it to you from this perspective. These are the holes or the foramen that I was talking about where other nerves exit the actual sacral bone. And if we look at it from a ventral perspective, you have a, a much more clear perspective of the foramen where nerves enter and exit, okay? So again, this is a lateral perspective or looking at the bone from the side. This is a dorsal perspective as if you were looking at the sacrum from above. This is a perspective from the bottom, which is what we say is a ventral perspective. And this perspective is as if you're looking into the horse from the front. So this is a cranial perspective. And this is an amazing bone because of the articulating surfaces, meaning where the sacrum actually articulates with other bones within the horse's body. So I wanna bring your attention to these articulating surfaces. We have these trans, or we have these uh, transverse processes here. So we have an articulating surface here on the sacrum, here on the sacrum, as well as here, okay? Now, these three articulating surfaces 
are going to come together with the last lumbar vertebrae. Now, the next thing that I wanna show you are two other articulating surfaces, right here and right here. These articulating processes also connect directly to the last lumbar vertebrae, since we're talking about sacral connections, okay? So here's one, two, three, four, and five. And I'm gonna reserve the last two articulating surfaces until we lay the foundation down here a little bit. And then we're gonna look at um, another joint in particular, okay? So again, five articulating surfaces cranially on the sacrum. Now these cranial articulating surfaces are going to connect with the last lumbar vertebrae of the horse. So I happen to also have the lumbar spine here. I'm getting a little bit like Pam and Diane being like creepy bone person with a bunch of dead animals around me all the time. I had some construction workers here today and they had all these bones laying around and I'm like, oh my word, I wonder what these people are thinking, but who cares? <laughs> So what you're seeing here is you're seeing the last lumbar vertebrae. And what you are seeing is actually what is referred to as the caudal surface of the last lumbar vertebrae. Anytime I say the word cranial, it means towards the head. And anytime I say the word caudal, it means towards the rear. This is a lateral view of all six lumbar vertebrae. This is a dorsal perspective and a ventral perspective. But for the sake of tonight, what I wanna bring your attention to is the caudal articulating surfaces of the last lumbar vertebrae. So again, just like what we saw with the sacrum, we have an articulating surface here, 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 and we have two articulating surfaces here and here. So what that means is that the sacrum connects directly to the sacrum here. So the five articulating surfaces come together and this forms a very special joint, which is referred to as the lumbosacral joint. And it is very important to be able to recognize this because this flexion and extension that happens here at this joint is in fact how the horse begins the process of engagement of the hindquarters. Okay, now I want to lay this foundation down because there's another joint in this region that often gets very confused with the lumbosacral joint. And those are the sacroiliac joints, which we'll look at here shortly once we spend a little bit more time talking about this particular joint, okay? So again, five articulating surfaces on the caudal surface of the last lumbar vertebrae connecting to five articulating surfaces on the cranial surface of the sacrum. Coming together, they form the lumbosacral joint, okay? So now I'm gonna go back to my, uh, my screen and I'm gonna share again uh, my slide. All right, here we go. Where'd it go? Okay. And now we can look a little bit more closely at the actual lumbosacral joint. So again, the graphic there on your right shows the entire vertebral column. We've got the cervical vertebrae in green. We have the thoracic vertebrae in red. 
we have the lumbar vertebrae in blue, and we have the sacrum in yellow. And in the other graphic, you can clearly see as if you had 3D vision like Superman through the pelvis to see the lumbosacral joint. And we'll see how this all comes together with the pelvis in just a moment. So again, the lumbosacral joint is where the last lumbar vertebrae connects to the sacrum. This joint is where the horse's hindquarters attaches to the rest of his body. And that's really pretty cool if you think about it. You think about the entire hindquarters of the horse is actually connected to the rest of the body through this very specialized joint. The lumbosacral joint happens to offer some of the greatest degrees of dorsal ventral flexion within the spinal column. So there have been lots of different uh, researchers that have looked at the amplitude of this specific joint, but approximately the degrees of flexion and extension that we have here is about 23 degrees, which is quite extensive, okay? So it is at this joint that the engagement of the horse's hindquarters begins. We don't always think about the lumbosacral joint as being the highest joint in the horse's hind limb. We always think of the other joints in the horse's hind limb, like the hip joint, we think about the stifle, we think about the hawk and so forth. But really the highest joint in the horse's hind limb is the lumbosacral joint. And the horse will not engage the hindquarters unless he brings this joint into flexion. And the higher the degree of collection, the deeper the degree of flexion at this particular joint. So when the horse engages his pelvis or when he flexes at that lumbosacral joint, that is what brings his pelvis and his hind legs deeper under his body. And the deeper that the hindquarters can come under the body, the more flexed all the joints can be in the hind limb, which is com what compresses the horse's hindquarters. And of course, that's just, again, just one piece of the puzzle. We have lots of other things that have to go on in the horse's body, but this is a major component that the horse has to be able to tap into in order for him to come into balance under the weight of the rider, and even more so when we're talking about degrees of, of collection. Now I wanna share a, a cool little story. So I'm gonna come out of this screen share again and I'll come back to the slide. So, You're a little freezy. Oh, is that better? Yep, you're back. Okay. <clears throat> um, When I was in graduate school and I was learning about these structures, which just seems like eons ago now, I read this really, really cool um, paper on the evolution of the horse. And one of the things that they talked about in the evolution of the horse <clears throat> related to these articular processes right here. And you see that they parallel one another, okay? Now in the prehistoric horse, those articular processes did not parallel one another. As a matter of fact, oh, you got a little freezy again. Do you, do you know why that might be? When you wanna oh, say it again? A little again? freezy again. <clears throat> yes. So in domesticated horse, these articular processes parallel one another, okay? But in prehistoric horse, that wasn't the case. In prehistoric horse, those articular processes were actually angled out to the side. Do you know why that might be? I haven't a clue. <laughs> well, little prehistoric horse was really little, okay? And he, and he lived in the woods. So when 
the animal that wanted to eat prehistoric horse, when the little prehistoric horse ran away from the thing that wanted to eat him, he had to weave around trees. So if those articular processes were angled out to the side, it allowed the sacrum and the pelvis to twist around wow. the trees to get away from the predator that was trying to eat him. But then as horse evolved and he became a, uh, a, uh, an animal that lived on the grasslands and now when the thing that wanted to eat him went after him, he didn't have to weave around trees anymore as opposed to just running fast as he could straight in a straight line. So those articular processes went from this, which allowed the sacrum to roll and rotate the pelvis and the lumbar to being more vertical so that now the sacrum at the lumbosacral joint produced a straight pumping action that flexion and extension, that flexion and extension, which allowed him to coil and push off forward to run away from the thing that wanted to eat him. Wow. So isn't that cool? Yeah. I, I think that is just like the coolest thing. And this is what I mean, why I get so excited about studying functional anatomy. Because when you understand that that joint is specifically designed for that action, suddenly you understand why it is that you want the horse to engage the hindquarters. And because from those deeply bent joints, he can produce more vertical or forward motion. So that joint is specifically designed as a pump and to coil and to flex so that the horse can generate the power that he needs for whatever it is that he wants to do. And of course, that's aided by the function of the thoracic sling and other structures within the body. So I th think that's kind of a cool little history lesson about the evolution of the horse and why it is that the horse moves the way he does, domesticated horse, modern horse, the horse that we ride, and why it is that we want the horse to flex at this very particular joint. Okay, now I'm going to go back to our screen share. I love those little kind of tidbits because, you know, those are just really interesting little facts. <laughs> I think so, but I'm a nerd and I geek out on that type of thing. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Given the story that I just shared, the, the sacrum on the left is an example of a prehistoric horse's sacrum compared to a domesticated modern day horse. And you can see that those articular processes on the sacrum on the left do in fact angle more outwards, whereas the sacrum on the right, we have more paralleling which is what gives our horses the pumping action that they have today. All right, now I have another really cool fun fact. So Wendy, what do you think about the sacrum that you see on the top? Any thoughts about that? Um, it's looking a little bit curled in those articular processes. <laughs> Exactly. Now, when I teach my functional anatomy class, I always bring this sacrum out and I show people and, and they're just appalled. They're like, oh my gosh, what was wrong with this horse? Because it looks as if the sacrum is completely fused. And then when you look at the right, on the top right, you're going to notice that those articular processes, like you said, are curled. Okay. So if those articular processes are curled, is it possible for this animal to deeply coil? And it is a horse sacrum, yeah? <laughs> no, it's not a horse sacrum. <laughs> That's why I'm like, this does not look like a horse sacrum. <laughs> it's not. Good. It's, it's a cow. <laughs> okay, good. I'm like, this is like very confusing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. It's a cow sacrum. So th this is what's so interesting about learning about cross species comparison. And when you start to look at how other animals move, you realize that their structure sets them up for particular motion possibilities. So if you look at the, the top two uh, pictures, they look very different than the bottom two because it's not the same species, okay? So when we look at the cow sacrum, which I have here, and then I will stop my screen share, come back to here. <clears throat> this is a cow sacrum. You can notice that it is much more ossified than the horse sacrum, but that it looks particularly different from the cranial perspective, particularly when we're talking about these two articular processes that curl, okay? Now, for years, Oops. For years, this cow sacrum was my doorstop at home. <laughs> I was feeling very Georgia O'Keeffe, right? So I had like bones setting around for decor. And I got to looking at this cow sacrum and I thought to myself, there is no way that with articular surfaces like this, that a cow would be able to coil or to engage the hindquarters like a horse. And that was just very fascinating to me. And it just drove home that the study of functional anatomy is actually very important because if you understand how it's supposed to move, you are way ahead of the game in terms of choosing exercises that you want to engage with your horse, that you learn about what works for the horse's structure as opposed to against the horse's structure, okay? So when you look at the cow sacrum, you see that these are curled. Now, if the lumbar was attached here, you see that there's very little ability for the cow to coil its loin. However, there's something that a cow can do that a horse can't, and that is cow kick. So this structure is what allows the cow to do this. And that is why a cow can cow kick you as opposed to a horse whose articular processes are parallel, which allows very specifically for the pumping action. So growing up as a rodeo brat, you know, when I was very young, I spent, I swear, every single weekend of my young childhood either at a rodeo or at a sale barn because my, my parents were horse buyers and sellers. And we couldn't wait to go to the rodeo and we would watch the saddle bronx and the, and the bareback bronx. And if you had to tally up who won, the cowboys or the horses, usually the cowboys won. And that's because the action of the horse's hindquarters is a pump. It's a flexion and extension and a flexion and extension. And from that, much of that motion is what helps the horse in terms of its vertical impulsion as well as its forward impulsion. So this is very predictable. So the cowboys can ride in a particular way to ride that action because it's more predictable than what happens later in the rodeo which is the bull riding. In bull riding, if you were to tally who won between the cowboys and the bulls, almost always the bulls win. And that's because they have the ability to twist and to roll their pelvis. And if you think about that, here's a cowboy sitting on 1,200 pounds of pot roast that's just twisting and writhing around. And that is very, very, very difficult to ride compared to the horse. Very hard to ride a bull versus riding a horse based upon 
their structure. And this is also why in a cutting horse, a cutting horse, because they coil the loin, they can sit very deeply, bending all the joints of those hind limbs so that they can rock it off to get ahead of the cow to cut it back into the herd. But the calf doesn't have that. So the, the calf is always going to be slightly slower because they don't have the same generating push off power that the horse does. So if you ever watch a cutting, you'll notice that the horses will sit. Oops, a little freezing the calf. Look at the calf. Okay. There you go. If you look at the calf, can you if you look at the calf, his butt will be a little high and he'll be totally downhill. And if you watch calves play in the field, they bounce around. They're really cute little buggers, but they don't coil their loins. And if you watch a cow jump, he'll rotate his whole pelvis to get the hind legs over. He doesn't bend and flex and curl up like a horse would over a jump. And it's all based on their structure and what their structure allows or doesn't allow. Well, the other thing that's so interesting about the cow sacrum is the, the amount of surface area for the other three joints that you've talked about. It's huge. It's <laughs> ginormous. It's, it's absolutely huge. And just in recent years, I've become very interested in cross-species comparison because I feel like it's helped me delve even deeper into understanding how the horse's anatomy functions so that I can pre prepare my horse in terms of their posture so that I can then allow the movement that I'm looking for from the horse. But if I don't really understand how the horse moves, it just becomes a guessing game, right? So, so, so riding without theory at the end of the day is kind of a guess. But if you have the theory and you have the technique, then suddenly you can become an artist and you can, you can become a critical thinker. And like Manolo always says, it's one of my favorite quotes that he, he, he said to me, and that is, I can train a hundred horses in the movement of shoulder in, but I'm going to train it in a hundred different ways. But at the end of the day, it's still shoulder in. And that's very true. The function is the same, but you might need several different types of techniques in your pocket to resonate with that particular individual. And Moshe Feldenkrais, right? Wendy said the same thing. If you only have one way of asking for something, it's pretty primitive. Yeah. If you have more than one way of asking for something, it's better, but it's still kind of primitive. But if you have three, at least three ways of asking for something, the same thing, suddenly you start to have endless possibilities. And that's when I think you start to see people become very masterful in the art of horsemanship. When I think of the most artistic, beautiful trainers and riders, they have more than one way of asking for something that suits that particular individual, but it's still based on the basics of correct functional anatomy. Okay, and uh, now I'm just going to show you because I think it's cool. Um, last fall, I was, you know, perusing around the field. I, I like to hack my horses out at least once or twice a week to give them a little something different to think about. And I looked down in the ditch and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a skeleton. And it was a deer skeleton. And so like being the, the weird little bone person that I am, I jumped off and I picked it up and I brought it home and I, you know, I let it dry in the sun and so forth. But I, I grabbed it because I wanted to see, well, what does their lumbar vertebrae look like? And what does their sacrum look like? And so here I have a deer set of lumbar vertebrae. And they're very different because those articular processes kind of have a groove that they fit into making the vertebrae even more stable. And this is the sacrum. The horse has five dorsal processes, but the deer only has four. 
And you can see that it's much more narrow. And the sacrum has a tremendous amount of flexion and extension as well as the lumbar vertebrae. So if you... Oops. Little freezy. Oops. Uh-oh, a lot freezy. A lot freezy. Oh, you're back. <laughs> My back. Yep. It's the beauty of living in a barn dominium. <laughs> I'm surrounded by metal. But essentially what I was saying is that the deer sacrum has a tremendous amount of flexion, even more so than the horse. Because if you watch a deer in its agility in the way that they clear a fence, they can wrap themselves up in a very tight ball. Whereas the horse actually has a fair amount of rigidity to the spine. So this is the deer. Okay. So now I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. There we go. Share. And we're gonna go here. There we go. So again, this is just a slide showing the difference between the cow sacrum and uh, the horse sacrum. And this is an example of looking at the difference between the difference of a bull versus a horse. So you can see in the top just how much rotation the bull can um, achieve at the lumbosacral joint versus the horse that is primarily based on flexion and extension. Okay. Now we're going to talk about another set of very important joints in the horse's body. So in review, we looked at the sacrum and we looked at the cranial surface, which had five articulating surfaces that connected to the last lumbar vertebrae. And that joint is what allows for a tremendous amount of flexion extension, which is so important to the athleticism of the horses that we ride. Now we're going to look at the last two articulating surfaces on the sacrum. Again, we looked at these five articulating surfaces. Now, if I turn the sacrum this way and we're looking at it from a dorsal perspective, you're gonna notice that there is a roughened surface here and there is a roughened surface here. So what that means is that the sacrum now is going to attach or to articulate with another bone. And that bone happens to be the horse's pelvis. So I have a horse's pelvis right here. And to orientate you to the pelvis, this bony palpation point right here, we have one on the right and we have one on the left. These are actually the tubercoxy or the horse's point of the hip. So when you're moving back on your horse and you get past the flank and there's that little bony protuberance, that is the tubercoxy or it is a palpation point of a larger bone, which is the horse's pelvis. Now, when we look at the pelvis from a cranial perspective, as if you're looking from the front of the horse into the horse, you have these two tall bony projections on top. These are called the tuber sacrales. If we look at it from a lateral perspective, here we have what's referred to as the acetabulum or the true hip. This is actually the hip socket where the femur articulates or comes together with the pelvis. And if we look at the pelvis from a caudal perspective or from the back, we have these two bony projections or bony protuberances. And these are the tuber ischiums or the seat bones of the horse. So 
the point of the buttocks, the tuber ischiums, or the seat bones of the horse, the true hip socket or the acetabulum, the tuber coxy or the point of the hip, this bone that scoops up and comes to the top to the, to the tuber sacrale is called the ilium. And these are the two tuber sacrales. All of these bony palpation points that I just talked about are part of one large bone known as the horse's pelvis. And if we look at the horse's pelvis from the ventral perspective, we also have what is called the pubic synthesis. Now this is actually mobile because when a mare gives birth through the birth canal or, or the pelvic room, the pubic synthesis softens due to the hormones so that the foal can pass, okay? Now, back to the sacrum. When you look at the ventral surface below from underneath of the pelvis, you're gonna notice that there's a roughened area here and there's a roughened area here, okay? In the live horse, you don't have holes here. These are just so that I can attach the sacrum to the ilium of the pelvis. So if you think about that, the word sacrum starts with S, the ilium, the word ilium starts with I. So logic dictates that where the sacrum connects to the pelvis, the ilium of the pelvis is where we find the SI joints or the sacral iliac joints. So the other remaining articulating surfaces of the sacrum are going to articulate to the ventral surface of the pelvis. And this is where the sacrum articulates with the pelvis at the sacral iliac joints. Okay, now I have two, two screws that I'm going to use to um, screw the sacrum onto the pelvis. If you have to do this with your horse, you're in big trouble. <laughs> um, and I don't really have time to talk about it, but there is such an amazing vast system of ligaments that actually hold or connect the sacrum to the horse's pelvis. Now, unlike the lumbosacral joint, which primary purpose is flexion and extension, the sacroiliac joints are not about flexion and extension. The sacroiliac joints rather work like, um, let me think. These joints are exposed to um, torsional movements as well as shear forces. These joints aren't flexion and extension joints. The SI joints in the past, anatomists used to say that there was no motion possibility at the sacral iliac joints, but they have come to realize that there is motion possibility here. It's just not a flexion extension type motion possibility. Um, and the amplitude of motion here is not huge. But I wanted to connect the sacrum to the pelvis so that you could see how the sacrum and pelvis move in relation to the last lumbar vertebrae at the lumbosacral joint as a unit. When I started studying this, I could not get it. I could not understand it because I was looking at two dimensional graphics and pictures and books. It wasn't until I actually got my hands on the bones that I could conceptualize how this region of the body actually moves. 
And so if you ever get a chance to go to Pam and Diane's bone room, I couldn't recommend it more. I was supposed to go uh, this fall and I just, uh, I actually got sick. I had, I got overexhausted, And so I wasn't able to go, but I, I tell all, all, all the people that I know, if you ever get a chance to go to the bone room, you should go. So I'm gonna be down in that area in December and uh, it's on the top of my list to go visit the bone room because I think what those ladies have done there is just exceptional and they are offering so much learning to the horse community. Um, Pam, just put in the chat your web, website so that people can find the bone room. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I'll bring this in a little closer. You can see the wings of the sacrum now articulating or coming together with the ventral surface of the pelvis. Where these two screws are essentially is where the sacral iliac joints are and there are two of them, okay? Now here you see the sacrum and the pelvis as a unit. The caudal portion of the sacrum is always gonna sit slightly higher than the cranial surface of the sacrum. Now, again, if I bring this all together, the last lumbar, had it in the wrong direction. I haven't even had my bourbon yet. Here we go. All right. So here we have the whole unit together. And when the horse flexes or coils or engages his hindquarters, it is here that that happens. Well, and I think it's really interesting to note the fusion on the last two uh, lumbar there that there's nothing gonna happen there. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and, and I'm, I'm actually really just so pleased that you, that you uh, caught that. Um, and I talk a lot about this in my functional anatomy class. And that is if you look at the last transverse processes of the lumbar, you'll notice that these are fused. In the living horse, now the horse is, is different than any other mammal in this way other than the rhinoceros because the rhinoceros and a horse are related. These in the living horse are actually um, synovial articulating joints, intertransverse joints, ITJs. So this is a joint and this is a joint and there's a joint here and here as well. And in some horses, these fuse. And in other horses, they don't. So I'm always on a hunt to learn more about these joints. The only place that I have found information written about those joints in particular, which I'm sure there is literature out there. So if any of the viewers have literature on this, I would love to read more about it. But the one book that I have found that does talk about that, oh, I guess it's backwards on the. On no, the no, screen. we've got it. It's right for us. It's backwards. Is it right for you? It's, it's right for us. It's right for you. Okay. So it's Horse Structure and Movement by Goody and Smythe. And in this book, they talk about these particular joints. And Dr. Goody uh, writes about how in all the dissections that he has done throughout the years, that it tends to be the exception, or it, 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 it tends to be the rule rather than the exception that these joints fuse. And when these joints fuse, and I don't know why they fuse or why they don't fuse. I don't know why they're fused in some and why they're not in others. But he said in the process of that fusing that it's painful. And once it's fused, similar to the hawk, that the pain resides. And he also went on to say that when it fuses, it can sometimes fuse on one side long before it fuses on the other side. And that made me go, uh-oh. 
because this whole area of the horse, the low back, the lumbar span, lumbosacral joint into the sacrum, into the SI joints, and even into the uh, coccygeal vertebrae. A lot of times we see this lumpy, bumpy top line here, very undulated top line. And we immediately go to, it's a hunter's bump. But it isn't necessarily a hunter's bump. Again, why the study of functional anatomy is so powerful, because if you've got an undulated top line and you know the structure, you know where that undulation is. Now, being somebody that you know, has started many, 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 many horses. Now I'm not a Grand Prix classical rider yet. I will be someday under the tutelage of my teachers, right? But I have started many, 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 many horses. And what I have heard time and time again from trainers and riders and so forth, and I'm sure you've heard this a hundred times, Wendy, Oh, he started off so nice and about a year or two into training, suddenly starts to crow hop into the canter. Or he wants to kick out in the canter. Or now all of a sudden he's becoming disunited behind. Um, or he gets back sore and then we blame our saddle fitter or our hoof care practitioner. But after learning about this, I went, could some of these behaviors, which I never think it's because the horse is being bad, but could some of these behaviors be a byproduct of this fusion process happening? And if this fusion process is happening, how does that correlate with the straightness of my horses? And we all know if we look at a horse long enough, they all look lame. But if, if it fuses on one side before it fuses on the other, logic dictates that the horse can only be asymmetrical. And you really see that on circles when the horse cannot track up appropriately in a two track. So I always think about this and I don't know if there's really any good way to, um, I don't think you can radiograph this, you might be able to use stenigraphy. But, but the fusion of these joints, I think, is a very fascinating research topic. And if I went on for my PhD, I think that might just be what I would do. And I'm very curious about, do we see these changes more in some disciplines versus other disciplines, like jumping or reining versus horses that are just hacked or worked on the flat? So um, I think it offers a lot of very interesting questions. So, now, um, I just want to mm -hmm. kind of throw in some comments here that we've gotten on this one because this has generated a lot of interest. Um, at some point, we need that title of the book again. But the question, mm -hmm. so Pam saying, and I, I agree with this, that it fuses for stability. But the question is, has anybody looked at horses of different age to see when that fusion starts? Has there been any study like that to, to look to see, is it, you know, is this, part of the natural maturing process of the skeleton because the mm -hmm. pelvis doesn't fully set until what, six? Yep. Or is this something that's happening after six and maybe a result of uh, the, the, the job the horse has? Do we know that? Not as far as I know. Now, when I talked to Sharon May Davis about this, she told me that she thought it was more prevalent in mares because when they carry weight from, from being pregnant that that stabilizes that lumbosacral sacral junction. Um, Dr. Goody says that the, the rate and age of the horse is random, um, but this is an older book already. So I'm guessing that there ha there's been research on it. I'm just familiar. It also, as I said, logic dictates that that might fuse because if you look at the surface, the articulating surface of the sacrum to the last lumbar vertebrae, it would make sense that those joints would fuse to stabilize this, what I would call downtown Manhattan. This is a hotbed of action right here. So it would make sense that it would, um, that it would lend itself to stability. Now, um, Pam, you'll appreciate this uh, from Wolf's Law. 
which is basically that bone will adapt to the loads um, under which it is placed. I don't know if you can see it very well, Wendy. When you look at these, can you see how different they are? Oh yeah. No, they're hugely different. Okay. Hugely different. So in my mind, I go down the road, mm, this horse fused on one side before he fused on the other side. And I would guess that that would have changed his way of going. Or, or is it possible that those uh, processes were different at birth and therefore, I mean, you could flip it around, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. the problem is we really don't know. And um, Pam's commented that the last two lumbar uh, typically fuse and they can happen in young horses. So um, there are studies and can be in very young horses and fusion of the last three lumbars typically in older horses. Uh oh, you froze. I happen to know that this horse was about eight. Oh, okay. And then I have, I have another fully articulated skeleton that is not. I would say it, the horse is older than six and there's no fusion at all. It's as, as clean as a bell. Wow. So um, Pam, if you have additional research on this, I just, I find it very fascinating as somebody who enjoys the process of supporting horses through a training program to just be <laughs> you've got empathy. Sam says you've got to come to the bone room. We should make a date and I should show up when you go. <laughs> I know. I'll get there. I hope. I hope okay. in December. Um can you hold up Dr. Goody's book again and I'll type it in so that people have it in the chat. Absolutely. It's a horse structure. There is another book by Good it's a basic anatomy. It's Goody second edition. I always recommend to my students to get the Goody book and this book because the, 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 the Goody book on anatomy is straight up anatomy, but this gives a great amount of detail about functional anatomy. And this was a primary book that I used uh, a lot in my um, the bone rooms in, in North Carolina, right? South Carolina. Aiken. Pam, where's your bone room? I put the I put the website in the chat, but Pam's getting close to a thousand skeletons, which is really impressive. <laughs> yeah. I remember when you were just That's starting right. it, Pam, when you were just thinking about doing it. I'm I want to so know where she, where is she storing it. them all. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, so I think this, this is something valid. Take into consideration if your horse starts to show difficulties with some movements or they seem to get obstinate about certain things and not just to blame your saddle fitter or your hoof care practitioner if something like this might be happening. And I've talked to some vets that say that maybe they could use stenography to identify heat. And some vets even feel like they can palpate some of these certain regions. And we also have to remember that these dorsal processes are attachment sites above for the longissimus muscle and the psoas muscles ventrally. So Yannick Vlugin, um, my uh, teacher in osteopathy school, and Diane could relate to this, and I, I'm not sure if Pam might be starting that program as well. But I asked Yannick about it and he said that he found that very interesting because upon palpation, he has come across many horses that have had um, very asymmetrically developed psoas muscles. And in the beginning, he thought it was because there was an injury to the psoas muscle and that's what was creating the discrepancies. But then he thought maybe this fusion process and the use of the body during that process might be con a contributing factor to um, the asymmetry in the, in the psoas development. And we could go down the rabbit hole. We could go that. down rabbit holes because like in people, some people don't have both psoas major and minor. Really? That's yeah. so interesting. Is that you know, true for horses? 
so you can have because you have so as major and so as minor so you could have so as minor on one side but not on the other right so that's amazing the, the beauty of of that, that it's called individual variation and that's a great catch term because you know so much of this stuff like what you're looking at in terms of the fusions of the lumbar spine the question is is this simply individual variation is this simply evolution that 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 it's fusing so that there's greater stability in the lumbar at the just before the lumbosacral joint or is this an abnormality and you know there's it's that is a very difficult question to answer yeah um, see i think wouldn't it just be like the coolest research study yeah, but I think it would require an, a lot of horses <laughs> of, of varying ages. And you have, yeah, I think you have to look at them on necropathy because you can't, mm -mm. I don't know if you can get to this with an MRI or not, but I know you can't x-ray, I know you can't x-ray it. Right. Um, but I, I, I have certainly, I, it's been my experience, you know, unfortunately, you know, growing up in the quarter horse industry, we started horses way too young. And a lot of times they started out beautifully, but then at four and five, all of a sudden you started to have these low back um, issues. So like, particularly in things like cutting and jumping yeah. and reining, you know, I'd be very in interested to see you know, how the body adapts to, to the particular discipline, of course. And that individual variation is, is so important to recognize because that's why I'm very careful. And I use the word generalized a lot because, you know, we have our basic anatomy, but there can be many, many different. Oh, there. Let's go. Like, like, you know, as you said, with the psoas muscle with the human, that's like crazy cool. And yeah. then if you look at the variation between people in terms of, you know, where their acetabulum sit, are they on the side or on the, are they more forward? H how long is the femoral neck? How much is the carrying angle? And all of that plays a big role in how the leg hangs. Absolutely. Yeah. Saddle. So there is a, a, a ton of variation. And I think too, you know, Wendy, that's very important in the study of functional anatomy as well, because it's a really wonderful um, example of why cookie cutter training just should be in the days past. Because each horse absolutely is an individual, you know. Um, something also very interesting is uh, I, I've been so incredibly lucky and blessed to be able to take a couple lessons from Bettina Drummond. And I have a gelding um, by a stallion that Bettina trained. And she had told me that they were notorious for having a difficult canter. And I hadn't said anything to her prior to her sharing that information with me um, because the gelding that I have, and she said it's particularly in the right hind. And he has from day one been very difficult to canter and he's always had a little something in the right hind. Mm. Well, I finally got an X-ray of it and the medial condyle of the, uh, of the, of the femur um, as it articulates to the stifle is perfectly flat. And uh, Dr. Dutton said, yeah, he was born with that. So I shared that with Bettina and she says, that's a gift from his sire, right? So that is an example of, you know, you have these variations and those variations create different types of movement patterns. So it's not that he's lame, he just uses that stifle slightly differently because of the way that the bones are formed internally. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of uh, that recognizing, you know, we have this funny um, oh, myth, if you will, that every horse is has the same skeleton and every person has the same skeleton because when we look at a skeleton, we look at a model. And so it's, you know, it, and we're taught there's so many, you know, 206 bones and this is what they are and we give them names but it's only until you start looking at individual bones and handling them that you realize that 
no two bones are alike, even though they might be both, you know, humorous, it's not the same humorous. <laughs> yeah. It, I just find that, I just find it so, so, so very, very, very interesting. And you know, it was probably maybe five years ago, I was teaching in Australia, the, in my basic functional anatomy class. And the gal that was hosting me said, um, hey, you want to meet Sharon Davis? She lives right down the road. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I want to meet her. She's like one of my heroes. And I tell you what, she was so nice. And, you know, watching her on your webinar, she's funny. She is so funny. Yeah, she's funny. She's so funny. Anyway, she, um, she, I was staying in this little cabin and, and she came to meet me there and we had tea. She brought her mom and I had some bones sitting on the table and she picked up a bone and just like a book, she started reading it Wow! because she could see the forces of the muscles and how the bone developed. And she said, this horse would have moved this way and that way. And I was just like, she was like a fortune teller. It was, it was so amazing. Um, and so what I would like to do is to bridge that knowledge of being able to look at a horse, um, you know, their, their skeleton after, after they've crossed a rainbow bridge to start trying to acknowledge what some of the movement patterns are doing to the very deep structures within the body, you know, and it, it always takes me back to um, the book written by Dr. Sarah Weish. Um, I think the muscles in motion, horses back in motion, they're phenomenal books. And she has a little passage in there that said, um, you know, the superficial muscles, they, they, they like, like sand in the desert, they, they change frequently, they ebb and flow, right? But over time, that ebb and flow, the winds, right, or the changes in, in, in the superficial muscles, over time, that starts to take its toll on the deeper structures until it gets to the bedrock, which would be the bones. So that the bones at the end of the day tell you the long story, mm. you yeah. know, and, and that is that, that, that is really uh, stuck in my head all these years so that I try to, to, to go in a different direction before negative changes get to the bedrock. And sometimes we can't, you know, we can't avoid it because either they're born that way, it happened in the embryologic stage, or they have a pathology or whatever. And I always tell my students, when you get to know your horse, it's your job to know your horse. You know, you should know your horse way better than I know your horse. But then you start to see their box of limitation and you work them within that box of limitation. But your goal is to see if you can make that box bigger and to bring about more and more and more motion possibility and that that mo motion possibility is supported by the stabilizers so that the horse can become stronger and stronger so that they can carry the weight of a rider in a beautiful artistic way without doing damage to the body. That's what I feel passionate about. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Oh, we've got a question. Um, so we have a question. Sometimes a horse has a steep hip angle, goose rump, and on the other end of the spectrum, there is the Arabian horse with a flat croup. Can you show the bones, uh, show with the bones what each conformation would look like? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So here we go. I put it all together. In, in, in osteopathy, um, and Diane could probably speak more clearly, or my partner could speak more clearly about this. Um, Yannick teaches about what's referred to as nutation and counter nutation of the sacrum and pelvic connection, meaning it's either very deeply angled this way or deeply angled this way. When in fact, you want to be able to ha have the full gamut of motion possibility. If the horse can only maneuver and hold its pelvis and, and sacrum this way and doesn't have this action, then that is what they would refer to as a disorder. And they would look to try to restore motion possibility to the sacrum. So if you have a goose rump horse, you have a horse that has more of this angle, very steep. If you look at the tuber ischiums, the tuber ischiums will be very low, okay? Whereas with Arabs, 
and it, and we've done a um, and I probably won't be popular for saying this, but we've done a huge disservice to a lot of our Arabs by breeding genetically too horizontal, too horizontal of a pelvic articulation. So this would be a very horizontal pelvis, and this would be a more goose rumped individual. Now, if you have a horse that's more angled, where the pelvis is sitting this way, a normal pattern would be that the lumbars would also be more flexed. If the pelvis is sitting more horizontal, you would have more of an extended lumbar span. From an osteopathic perspective, if you have a lumbar or if you have your sacrum and your pelvis sitting at a deeper angle and your lumbars are in extension, that doesn't follow a normal pattern. And that's what they would refer to as a decomp, a decompensation. It's not following a normal pattern. And in that way, that usually also means that it's painful. If the horse is very steeply angled, he should have more of a, a flexion in the lumbars or more kyphosis. So it just follows a normal pattern. If the pelvis is more extended, you would see a more extended lumbar spine. But a lot of that, especially with the Arabs, that's bred. And you can find a genetic, genetics for a goose rump horse, but that can also be from injury. And, and really only a vet or a professional body worker would be able to, to determine that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So somebody's asking about Andalusians. Yes. And their pelvic, I assume their pelvic to lumbar shape. They're a little bit more angled this way. It's not as much as I love Iberian horses. They are my heart. I love them. I, I, I'm, I'm a nut for Iberian horses, particularly Lusitanos. But it's not my, my breed in terms of what I know the most about, right? So like I'm on a, a hunt in the next year for a, a young Lusitano to bring up under the tutelage of my teachers. Um, but I reach out to my teachers who have a lot more experience with that particular breed. Now, if you were talking about a stock horse, I can help you hands down, but that's not a breed that I am an expert or a specialist with. So I always try to figure it out. People who know a lot more than I do when it comes to looking at anatomical arrangements specifically within a breed. I actually, uh, I, I do this little thing called a serrator review every month. It's just like a little membership thing. And this month is about how to pick your unicorn, which was a phrase that I, I uh, adapted or I, I, I stole from my friend Katie Munns, who teaches a course actually on how to pick your unicorn. And, um, and that was one of the, su the suggestions that I made is that if you have a particular breed in mind, seek out somebody who really knows about that breed to help direct you, right? Because they, that's their specialty. And like, if I look at the quarter horse industry, which is, you know, the world that I grew up in, there are so many different types of horses within the breed. So if you put a hunt seed horse up to a, a cutting horse, they're both quarter horses, but they're going to look specifically for a particular discipline and too often I have clients who buy a, a horse that was bred for a specific job and then they want to make it a dressage horse and it's not that the horse can't do dressage but it might be more difficult for the horse because it just wasn't what the horse was bred to do so I think you know that there are are, are layers upon layers upon layers of study when we start looking at, at structure and what, bred, and what horses were bred to do. Well, right? and Bettina is also making the comment that there's a big difference between the angle of the working equitation Lusitanos and the light ones and the depth of the S 
SI versus hip angle. So there's you're going to have breed variations as well, depending on the focus of that. And now as we're trying to create sport horses out of closed book horses like Frisians, I think we're going to see uh, interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you, Bettina. Yeah, I think I just I think that that you know we just have to to really put our time into being humble and reaching out to people who know more and and owning what you what you know. There's nothing wrong with owning what you know, but you also have to own what you don't know, and 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 that's what makes the learning process so fun. And, you know, and no. Bettina, it was not light horses. It was bullfight horses. It was a typo. Bullfight horses. <laughs> so yeah. a difference between the working neck and the bullfight horses and the depth of the SI and the hip angle. That makes a lot of sense. Does that make a lot of sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I had read on one of Bettina's posts too that, or Bettina, that you were mentioning uh, your horses that you're working now and exhibiting, they were bred specifically for that job which I, I mean, I just admire that so much. They were bred for that and that's what they're doing. And Dr. Deb Bennett wrote an article many, many years ago about horses being bred for specific things like heavy draft horses working the field or light carriage horses or distance runners or short runners or horses bred specifically for riding. You know, it used to be that horses were bred for specific purposes. And now we're kind of getting into designer breeds and like Dr. Deb Bennett said, well, you can take a horse that was bred for a specific discipline and ride it doing something different, but then you have to consider it being more of a project horse. And that has always resonated with me. So like right now, like when I'm thinking about getting an, an, an Iberian, you know, I'm going to reach out to, to, to Bettina and other people who know just so much more than I do so that I, I have a horse that we can do the things that we want to do together. And one of the trainers that I worked for in college, um, his name is Jim Dudley. He's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful man. Um, he's an AQHA judge. You know, he's done everything within the AQHA industry in terms of um, disciplines that he's shown in and judged. And when I worked for Jim, we had 60 horses in training. I don't know how I did it, but we used to ride like 12 horses a day. And um, I will never forget this. There was a gentleman who, who pulled up and to drop off a young horse for training. And he had very, very high expectations for this horse to be a reigning horse. And he took the horse off the, tr the trailer and the horse had, was long, he had super long back. He was very slight. He had a U neck. Just struck. You're a little freezy. Uh oh, you're a lot freezy. I'm a lot. Oh, you're back. You oh, said U neck and we lost you. Okay. <laughs> So the horse was you necked and, and just his particular design was not suited for the discipline that he wanted the horse to be trained in. And I will, I will respect Jim to the day I die because what he said to this gentleman was very kind, but it was very true. And he said, I will put your horse in training, but I will find what it is that your horse enjoys and what your horse is good at but I have absolutely no interest in making your horse into something that he can't be. And that just really resonated with me. So I now, as I'm getting a little older, I know what I wanna do. I wanna become, I wanna learn more about classical dressage. I want to be, a, you know, working more towards high school work, more from an artistic perspective. So I want to look for a horse that it's easy for that horse to do that particular job, right? I'm not a good enough trainer to take a, a project horse and to help them along that way, unless I was guided every day by my teachers. So that's something I, I think people, you know, it would serve folks well to think from that perspective. 
And I also think you have to consider the, the horse mentally because just because he has the body shape for a particular task doesn't mean he has the, the desire. And my case in point is that there was a Northern dancer foal and I'm dating myself here back in the eighties that was perfect in terms of confirmation. I mean, he was gorgeous and he couldn't run out of a paper bag and he was impotent and he sold for $10 million at the yearling sales. <laughs> And that was, I disappeared. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him, but he certainly uh, didn't make it in his intended profession, you know. Um, and I had, uh, I think I may have mentioned, I was raised by an old cowboy and he was a real shyster, but he was a good, he was a good man and he loved me. And uh, for me, I needed that father figure. And and he, I mean, I just loved him and, and he took me under his wing and he was very, very dear and very, very special to me. And, you know, when I was younger, I thought that I, I, I was all that in the bag of chips because I was successful showing. And in later years, I realized that Glenn just always made sure that I had a horse that could just do the job. Um, and always he said to me, there, there's one thing you always want to look for, and that is a good disposition because there are a lot of horses that are very good quality, but, but they don't have the disposition to go along with their quality. So if you're gonna spend your time on a horse, spend your time on a horse that has a good disposition. And of course it has sound structure. And, and again, those have been words really that I've, I've lived by, you know, um, and, and you know, I, I have certainly had a few horses in my life that were that were really challenging and um, that frustrated me. And then I've learned more. And you know, when you when you know more, you 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 do better. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's the thing, you know, Bettina's mentioning a horse that uh, I actually knew called Fidelio. He was a northern dancer colt that sat sat back and refused to run. And an artist told me about him. So that's why she bought him. And he had a Piaf, like an Iberian horse. And I, I remember this horse so, so distinctly. So we can find horses. It's not necessarily the breed. In other words, we can find individuals within any breed that and, and have the capacity to do a particular task. Um, and I think when we, you know, that's something to keep in mind um, that sometimes we get so stuck on, um, that the breed that we think we want for a task when really it's an individual that, again, an individual that we're looking for that's going to suit us in that personality, in that temperament, and in that um, ab physical ability. And so we have to assess the horses on multiple levels mm -hmm. um, uh, because, you know, like, like Fidelio was, he was amazing. I remember him so clearly, um, but he did not look like a thoroughbred. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You know, it's like Sea Biscuit. Sea Biscuit should have never have, you know, done what he did. Yep. So you we know. do have a question um, about um, when we were talking about the sacrum and the lumbar spine, um, and they're asking if a more horizontal position could indicate kissing spine. Um, I noticed that when you had your lumbar spine up, one of the things that becomes very obvious is there's not a lot of. Um, uh, leeway in mm -hmm. the dorsal processes, the lumbar spine. Can you hold it up again? Because I yeah. lumbar spine is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. Bone nerds. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, it's there's so much stability that's created in the lumbar spine as opposed to mobility. Because if you you can't side bend because you're going to whack all those transverse processes together, and so it mm -hmm. it has a really particular job so um in the, and so that's really where we're getting the flexion is at this lumbosacral joint because clearly there's not a lot of possibility here right there's very very little side bend as a matter of fact between the the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine on average there's six to eight inches of lateral side bending but side bending is always coupled with rotation. So that bend that we see horses producing isn't because they're like a, a wiener dog that just like bends. It's because there's side bending and rotation involved. <clears throat> and that's why oftentimes when you're riding, 
and the horse bends to the right, you feel a little bit of this. Right. Um, so the shape of the lumbar vertebrae clearly defines the motion possibility. Now, when it comes to kissing spine, there's a lot of research now, and, uh, and you may have had guests that, that, that can speak much more um, intelligently about it, but there's a lot of genetics that play a role in, in the development of kissing spine. So posture, of course, can also play a part. It's not a death sentence if a horse has kissing spine, but you certainly want to be very cognizant about um, how you work that horse and the weight that you put on the horse. And that's something that I've also found very interesting about the sacroiliac joints. If you think, you know, we're bipeds. So our sac sacroiliac joints obviously are different because we have vertical forces from, from being a biped. But a quadruped, if you think about that, the whole axial spine hangs in between their front legs via soft tissue and the sling because there's no collarbone. So what maintains the spine? Well, when you come to the hindquarters, if you think about it, the spine is only suspended from the pelvis via the SI joints. So now we put our vertical forces on a horizontal plane that's really attached by the sacroiliac joints and a vast amount of dorsal ligaments that stabilize and hold the whole vertebral column together as well as fascia and muscles and so forth. But really, I mean, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. Our vertical forces sit on a horizontal plane that really is only connected at the SI joints. Which is why my instructors, when I was a kid, would let, never let me sit on my horse like a couch. Yes. My instructors too, actually Peggy Cummings is like, get off, don't sit on your horses. Your horse is not a couch. Yeah. And of course, coming from the Western world, we sat on our horses all the time. I know. I know but there's now, a whole mentality about sitting on your horse, but you know, mm -hmm. standing and walking are the hardest things the horse do under the load of a rider. Mm -hmm. um, because there isn't any suspension. And, um, you know, as, as Pam's pointing out, horses aren't really designed to carry weight from above. That's where training is so important that we strengthen that. And also breeding, because, you know, some of these horses we're breeding now have these incredible movements, but are we running into lax ligaments like we see in people so that we get this hyperflexion, but we don't have the stability of the ligaments that's required to do the job of holding up the weight? That is, that is, that is utterly important. You know, or even that we're breeding these horses with these re ridiculously short backs, like especially in the, in the thoracic spine, and now nobody can find saddles that fit because of this idea that a short back is a stronger back. Well, I'd still prefer a medium length thoracic spine, but a very short, strong loin. You know, it, I mean, man just keeps breeding. Messing, messing around. <laughs> right, um, you know. Yeah. So, you know, the hypermobility issue is, re is really, really a a an issue, which is, which is why we need to take time to strengthen the stabilizer muscle. Which brings me, this is a great segue, to, to your pads. Because, you know, m m proprioceptively standing on, if you were to stand on one foot right now, you all the thousands of little micro movements that you have to make to balance yourself through firing the proprioceptors and the stabilizer muscles. I mean, the pads are amazing for that you know, for the stabilization, because all of those, those cybernetic muscles, they aren't just around the spine, they're around all those joints. So, you know, I always call them the, the intellectual muscles because they're so, so much more innervated by proprioceptors. And I think the pads are, are just absolutely phenomenal for that, for that reason, as well as the, 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 the pads that can be used on the hind limb to, um, help horses that may have sacroiliac pain or a negative palmar angle behind it, it. I mean, it can really help 
uh, horses that have dis discomfort in the, in the spine and to lend to stabilization of, of the, the postural joints. Yeah, and you know, I saw a horse when I was at Equitana with Linda Tellington Jones that he was so uncomfortable in his hindquarters and we put him on a pair of hard pads and he stood there, this is all he wanted. He stood there for five minutes. When he came back in the afternoon, his pelvis was level. I forgot to say it wasn't level at first, but when he came back, it was level. It was amazing to see how much change can occur. It makes perfect sense to me. You know, it's, it's I mean, it's really, a, it's really a brilliant what, what, what you've done with the, those pads. I mean, just all the way around. And I know you're still collecting information as to why they work, but yeah. like that, one of the things that just like boom hit me right away and I can remember I, I, uh, Ida Hammer came to a class and we were talking about the um the surefoot pads and I said well I think they're brilliant because they like start to fire those stabilizer muscles you know and she's like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right you said like, Ida's so cool yeah so um yeah I think it, I think it's 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 really really it's really a, a genius thing, Wendy. I think it, it, it's very, very helpful. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. So we've had someone ask um, if you can put up a link in the chat for your online new, your new online course. Oh, I'm so terrible at promoting myself. Um, it, I think, um, if you go to my website, okay. Uh, that there will be information on there on how to sign up for a newsletter. And from there, they will send out um, information about when the course will be released. And, and then they're, they're fixing to do a... Um, What's it called? It's called, what is it called? I'll show you what it's called. <laughs> this is the, the cover of, of the booklet. Oh, cool. Great. And um, it's several hours long. Um, I'm going to say it's about 18 hours in, in totality. Um, you know, it, my job is collecting information that was researched and, and, and delivered by genius people in the field from the past to the present day. I feel like my gift probably is gathering that information, organizing it, and teaching it in a way that everyday people can make sense of. You know, the information in this course is, will be review for, for some people. It will be new for a lot of people. And for those people that are already familiar with it, maybe I just will use a language that they can use with their students. But really what I love doing is pulling it all together so that it makes the big picture come to life. And I think this, this particular course, that's what this course does. It's, it's information that many people, bits and pieces have been exposed to, but maybe they haven't seen it in totality. So, um, I'm very proud of it. And, and I've been teaching it now for 14 years. Um, and, you know, I have to change it all the time. And I always say, you know, it's my truth for the moment because I'll learn something tomorrow that might change. But the way that we've done it gives me the opportunity to make updates to it as I learn more and then to share it with the people who, who choose to, to, to purchase the class. So, so well, that, I, that, I that's, that it's, it's really important to realize that learning is dynamic as is writing and that, yeah. you know, as new information comes along, the wise person is able to say, well, that's what I used to say, but now I know more. Now I know better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's hard, you know, so many times, and I'm sure you've seen this too, is my students will go, oh, I've been doing it wrong. It's like, no, you've been doing what you knew. And as you know more, you can do something else, but you can't do something else you didn't know. Exactly. Which is why this is so cool to see the sacrum and see how that connects to the pelvis yes. and just see how, um, you know, that the thing that it keeps bringing me back to is the fact that uh, it's not just the bones that are holding all that together. There's so many ligaments and connective tissue that's really stabilizing that pelvis and that, that the bones are 
really just like you said, there's this really tiny little connection when you think about the whole hindquarters to the rest of the body. Yeah. I think that's why they always say it's just the bare bones, right? It's it's the basic, but there's so many layers upon layers that 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 make the horse a horse, and it it's systems upon systems. And then we look at how those all work in concert, and that can be very different for each horse. Yeah, and and Bettina's made a great comment. She said uh, that the the transmission's essential for the old test to be perfected for a new generation, just like my pads bring out the old parade in the new riders and, and well done to both of us. <laughs> Thanks, Bettina. Thank you. Um, you know, and it's really, it's, it's, it is about keeping the information alive for, for people coming along because some of these old books, you know, that just the language and the way that's referred to things, it's difficult for people to understand. And, and we, are lear we learn now in a very different way. So we have to like bring that information forward into the way people learn now because otherwise it'll get lost. And I think that that's really, really important. And I think our industry, it is, it's based on tacit knowledge passed down from a master to a student. And, and again, that's why I just wanted to emphasize that it's got to go way beyond what we learn on social media or in a book. Yeah. It's finding the masters that can impart the techniques onto the next generations. And I have a tremendous amount of admiration for the, the masterful people that do that because it's very important. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jillian, it, we've been going for over an hour and a half. Oh. <laughs> You and I can, we can yak forever, but this has been great, but I'm so grateful that you came back and it's really lovely to see what you're doing and, and how things are evolving. And um, we'll look forward to the next time we talk. When, Wonderful. When the thank, thank you so much, Wendy. And, and let's get you on our dance card here at Serrata. Oh, absolutely. We're going to do that. Yep, for okay. sure. And thanks everybody for joining us. Just remember you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And um, there we post them up on Facebook. They're on the Murdoch Method uh, newsfeed on Facebook. And you can subscribe to the Murdoch Method newsletter at murdochmethod.com so that every Sunday I post the webinars. I put out an email and you can get that email. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks again, Jillian. Have a great evening. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.